So how are y'all doing? Good. Recruiting good. Was ready. We got <laughs> archery nationals this weekend, so fingers crossed. We have a good run, and Chase and Kiki have another personal best performance. Even if they don't place, mm -hmm. as long as they have another personal best, I'm good. This weekend's nationals, right? Yes. Yeah. How long have they been shooting? Uh, two years. Two years, and they've been with Josh the whole time? Yeah. Yeah, That's he was... Cool. I was talking to him at the that tournament I went to. Where where was it? Um, in Murfreesboro, Manchester. Murfreesboro is, that, is that where it was? No, Manchester. The one that we sponsored. It was yeah. in Manchester. It was in Manchester. Yeah. Um, I was talking to him there, and they got. And I was talking to Tracy, and they got to talk. They were mentioning like personality profiling, and how certain personalities are they're different the way that they shoot and the way that they approach the target and what goes on in their head and all that kind of stuff is very different. Like um, Chase, for example, gets up there and he, he pulls back and then he thinks about it too long yeah, because he's wanting the shot to be perfect. And he's thinking about it too long. And then he winds up getting tired. And when he shoot, when he finally, you know, let's go, he's overanalyzed it, right? Paralysis by analysis. And that's what affects his accuracy. And then you've got like um, Kiki, who's the exact opposite. She just gets up and pulls it back and lets it go. Right. And so that's what affects it. That's what affects her accuracy. So their personality styles are very different. So they were talking about how if they could find out what the personality style of the child is, then that would that would change their approach in coaching them. And I was like, well, that's pretty neat because we could actually do disc profiles on all of them and give that to you so that you can see what it is, you know, and then use that to use that to, you know, model your coaching after. Yeah, and I'm curious, would they want to use DISC or Kobe or Myers-Briggs or the Enneagram? Because there are so many different ones out there. Of course, yeah. we have easy access to DISC, right? But right, right. there are so many others. I'd be curious to know which one they would lean toward. If, you know, and we could make something available through DISC, but Enneagram's a little bit Enneagram's a little bit different. So you have yeah. to go through different channels. Somebody told me about a book uh, that's about birds and the, how the birds apply to the different. Was it Jocelyn? Was it you? I can't, we can't You're hear on you. Mute. It wasn't me, but I've heard of, I've heard that. They were talking about how it's like C type personalities are owls and D type personalities are eagles. And like they use like the characteristics of the bird to describe the behavioral patterns of people that have that personality style. And I haven't, I'd never heard of it, but I thought it was really interesting. Maybe it was Carrie. Might've been Carrie. It was probably Carrie. I know she I haven't would. heard of that, but I'm sure yeah. Carrie has. Yeah. I, I got a question for you. Do you know how with, with fortune, there's a clause. I need to ask Brad about it, but there's a clause in our franchise agreement about owning a certain percentage or greater of a company that has services that are directly or indirectly competitive or something like that. You know what I'm talking about? I don't. Conflict of interest. My, I'd have yeah. to go back to my franchise agreement. Yes, yeah, like I went through mine today and I couldn't find it anywhere. But I had a I got approached by a um by the owner of a uh, brokerage company. And so I've done a, done a couple of deals with him. I'm getting ready to do another deal. And he was like, man, where are you located? And I'm like, I live here. And he's like, Hmm. And I was like, what? He's like, have you ever considered, you know, like uh broker? He asked me if I broker practices, if I sell practice, I was like, no, nah, I, I, I don't broker them. I'm, I, I'm more on the buyer rep side. I do a lot of buyer rep coaching. Uh, and I have brokered a couple of transactions, but they're not, I don't, you know what I mean? Like I, I'm not a broker. And, um, so he asked me if I'd be interested in, in, uh, being a broker and which was what was interesting about that is that thought had already crossed my mind. I'm going through a certification process right now with the national business valuator, some, some, it's like the gold standard of business valuations. And, um, it's like this curriculum that you go through and then you get this certification at the end and you're a certified business evaluator. Right. So I could do evaluation on a dental practice rather than having to send that off and pay six grand for a CPA to do it, you know, um, 
and not the meth, not that the methodology would change because I know how to value a dental practice and it's very objective, but a lot of practice valuations are very subjective, right? It's like when they look at what, what multiple to apply to EBITDA, that multiple just kind of comes out of thin air. It's like, well, they collect this much and they're this profitable. So we're going to make it this number. And I'm like, no, dude, it's not how it works. Like I just did a, I just did two valuations in the last, this week, since, since yesterday, since Sunday night. And one of them was collecting, it's collecting like 500, 560, somewhere in there. Um, I think it's, I think he's taking home like 191 and I've got a client that's going to looking at buying that practice and merging it into his existing practice. He's got like 1700 patients. So he's got a big patient base, but the broker told me that they were asking 560. And I was like, okay, I didn't think anything of it until I like did, did the valuation. And I'm like, man, this thing's nowhere near worth that. It's not even close. Like my valuation came in at like 282. And even when we added AR to it, there's like 80,000 in AR. Even when I added AR to it, we're still at like three fifty. Like we're still two hundred thousand dollars away. I was like, "Where, where are you coming? Up? Where's the other two hundred thousand dollars coming from?" And this guy, that's this guy, that's the broker on this practice. He's not really a broker. He's a CPA that's trying to get into brokering practices. I think, you know, um, very nice guy, you know. But uh, I don't know. I gotta have a little chat with him and see. See if he could justify that number because we 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 want to do the deal, but we're just really far off on that number, you know. So, so and it was interesting when one of my clients had an associate that was going to buy in. We were at odds on our valuation and his accountants of his accountants valuation, mm-hmm. and they were like, "Can we?" And I pulled all the numbers together. I did three different valuations on that practice given what we know and what dental practices are worth. I did three different valuations, three different models, Mm -hmm. I guess I'll say, three different models of how this practice could be valuated, you know, given its collections, productions, all all of that kind of stuff. And the accountant kept coming back and, and he was like, well, show me your industry standard. And I was like, there's not an industry standard. I can go to four different brokers and they're all going to tell me something different. Mm -hmm. So you tell me your industry standard. I never got anything from it. Yeah. Ever. Yeah. We had the same same thing happen, John, on the the first one that you and I did kind of together um, up in Virginia, Mm -hmm. Southeastern Virginia. She had her financial planner and her um, accountant give her evaluation and both of them were way lower than ours, but she was the buyer. Yeah. So I think one thing about the way we do it is we're very objective. And I think if you've got an accountant or a financial planner doing it for their customer, they're going to lean more on their side. Right. Yeah. People, people, sometimes people think these things are worth way more than they are, you know? Um, But I admit the second one I did was very, it was the exact opposite. Like I did, it was a collecting a million. I didn't think it would be worth what it was, you know? And uh, I was like, I figured it. A matter of fact, yeah, I was talking to him. I was in his office on Saturday morning <laughs> and uh, I was running reports with him. And uh, he's like, so what do you think it's worth? And I'm like, dude, I can't tell you. I was like, I've, I've just looked at a handful of reports. I haven't seen your your financials. And he's like, well, I know, I know, but you know, give me, give me kind of a ballpark. What do you think it's worth? And I was like, not knowing anything else than what I've, other than the, the handful of numbers that I've looked at, and I haven't looked at like market data, but just not knowing anything else, where you're located, profitability, all that kind of stuff. I say it probably somewhere around 800,000. And he was like offended by that number. And I was like, well, let me tell you, man, you know, that that's, you know, you asked me for a ballpark number, that's a ballpark number. So he calmed down. I got back home. And uh, I started putting the numbers. I got a big spreadsheet that I use. I started plugging stuff in and then I went to my database and I pulled historical transactions and looked at what they sold for. So I look at, I go to, I've got a database I go to and it shows me comps, right? Like I'll go the last two years, show me every practice that was sold that collected, you know, this number or close to this number. Show me every practice that had an EBITDA in this range, right? And what it sold for. And so I'll take 10, I'll take a sample size of 10, 
And I'll take, I'll usually throw out the highest and I'll throw out the lowest. And then I'll plug those in and take the average. And that practice came out at like 1.25. And it's collecting a million. And I was like, holy cow, man. But uh, so I, I called my client and I was like, listen, you know, <laughs> This is where this thing's coming out at. You know, this is this is the market. This is a very objective valuation. This is what the thing is worth, right? And it just goes to prove that you're not, people look at like the top line revenue, they look at a million dollars, right? And they think two practices generating a million dollars in the same town, those two practices are going to be worth the same. They're not, they can be worth very different numbers. Because one might only be putting twenty percent on the other line, other bottom line. This practice was putting over was putting fifty one percent on the bottom line. Wow! You know, so he had five hundred five hundred one thousand dollars in discretionary earnings, right? Which is why the valuation came in where it did. I was like, he he made some smart moves, which made me think. Because a lot of these guys, they get it's that because they don't have a solid plan on the back end of when they want to transition. They wind up buying this really expensive piece of equipment like two years out, right? Like about hundred fifty thousand dollars piece of equipment. They're they're wanting to you know transition in a year. Well, that hundred fifty thousand dollars piece of equipment is going to deteriorate their profitability, which is going to devalue the practice. And they're like, well, I've got this hundred fifty thousand dollars piece of equipment. Well, yeah, but it's called market value for invested capital, market value on invested capital. That's invested capital. You know what I mean? So the market value of of this number of two two eighty includes that hundred fifty thousand dollar piece of equipment that you bought last year. Like you don't add that to it, right? And so uh, they, man, I wish more of these guys. And and the the guy that has the practice that came in with the really good valuation, I bet he had. I mean, I bet he's not bought a piece of equipment fifteen years. You know. So would we suggest that maybe, you know, if they if they're seeing down the road that they are going to want to sell, um, maybe look at buying equipment four or five years out from when they're when they're ready to kind of transition out? I think it depends. I think well, four I think, to five years, that equipment's going to be obsolete and they're going to need to upgrade to the newest generation. Yeah, well, I, I think it depends on what real tangible because most most equipment like Serac, right? The big selling point on Serac was it was going to eliminate your lab costs, right? Well, yeah, it reduced your lab cost cost, but it increased your supply costs, right? Because now you're buying all these blocks, right? So the the selling point on that really really didn't make a lot of sense. But is it a good idea to have that piece of technology in your practice? A hundred percent because it accelerates cash flow. Right. So now you're getting paid on the first data service rather than have it in two parts. Right. Uh, plus, you don't have the delay on the lab. So think about, you know, you do the prep on February 27th. Right. And a lot of insurances won't reimburse until the seat. Well, you're not going to seed it until March. You follow what I'm saying? So you incurred the cost in February, but you don't recoup the cost until March. Right. Okay, so that's impacting your cash flow. Whereas if you've got Serac, you get paid on the same day. There is no gap of when you incur the cost and when you got reimbursed and made money on it. So I think it makes a lot of sense from that standpoint and a lot of sense from just being attractive to patients. People want convenience and that's convenient. And you get extra chair time. Yeah. So I think that I think the sales so you are, actually don't get extra chair uh, time. Yeah. You really don't like the because the person seated longer. Right. Well, <clears throat> and actually, for for the most part, so let's say you're doing a two visit crown. You've got an hour for the prep for the most part, thirty minutes for the seat. That's an hour and a half. When they first onboard Sarek, they're booking two, two and a half, three hours because mm-hmm. they've got the design component right. So mm-hmm. there's the six to nine month learning curve depending on how quickly they get their assistance on the design process, how quickly they get their, their assistance involved. Um, but even with a Sarah crown, the chair time is the same, if not a little bit more. Mm-hmm. But it is the convenience and getting paid sooner. So sure. it's the time savings on the staffing from having to follow up on the claims and it's getting paid about two weeks sooner 
than what you would have not being production heavy and AR lagging. Yeah. And they look at, they look at um, another, another of the, the objections to Sarek is the, obviously we lose that chair for a longer period of time. Right. Um, and so to alleviate the pressure there, you've really got to have, you've really got to be working out of more operatories, right? Cause you're not going to get the patient out of the chair and send them to the reception area, then bring them back to seat the crown. You're yeah. going to leave them in the operatory with virtual reality goggles on or watching Andy Griffith or whatever it is. Right. Um, and then, uh, you're just going to have, you, you're just going to need more operatories to be able to work out of so that you're not hamstringed by that operatory being tied up by a patient. And the other, the other downside I see is these guys don't, they want to design the crown themselves. And then they want to spend 30 minutes adjusting the crown before they seat it. Yeah. And I'm like, two things, you, we got to get to a point where you delegate the design, your assistant's perfectly capable of that. If not, potentially could be better at it right? If that's all she's doing. And we've got to get them to a point where they're, you know, where the, the seat's not taking 30 minutes and adjusting and trying in and adjust all that needs to be done before you walk in there, you know? And so if they're not delegating what can be delegated, that's not Sarek's fault. You know, it's not, it's not the, it's not the machine's that's fault. Control but, factor. Yeah. Yeah. It's exactly it's what it is. So it's not the equipment's fault that you're not more profitable on it. It's your fault because you're not delegating what needs to be delegated. I mean, re- logically delegating. And but you're clear. My, oh, sorry. Go ahead. I just going to say, but my point there was, you know, do you buy equipment when you're two years out? It depends on how it's going to affect the bottom line. If it's realistically going to add revenue and add profitability, that it 100% makes sense. But if it's just going to be another cost, and you got to think, you got a learning curve there. Right. So like on Sarek, you got six to nine months. Some people take longer than that. Right. So you got to factor some that in. Some people take less. Yeah. Some right. people take less, you know, but it realistically, you got to be realistic about it. How's it going to affect your bottom line? Because when you buy a practice, you're not buying top line revenue. You're not buying a million dollars in collections last year. You're not buying $1.7 million in collections last year. You're buying $700,000 of discretionary earnings. Right. How much actual money can the owner take out of that practice in a 12 month period of time? That's what you're buying. Yeah. And here's something else that I've noticed with Sarek. So if you have if you have a doctor who's working out of a a four operatory practice running two rooms of hygiene and two rooms for his self or herself, unless they're fee for service and unless they are progressive thinking like bringing their hygienists along, I'm sorry, their assistants along, investing their Fridays on getting their assistants really comfortable with the design, there's going to be a negative impact on overall production and cash flows until they have that whole process mastered, which goes back to what you said, John. If they have five to six ops and running two rooms of hygiene or even three rooms of hygiene, as long as they have that additional operatory, then they have overflow. And it doesn't matter if the Sarek crown takes two hours or three hours in the beginning because they have that extra operatory that they Mm -hmm. can lean on. But when they are restricted by space and they've got to make every moment count, that's when it can be a little bit of, okay, so, so like one of my clients onboarded Sarah last year, but we just started a build out. Mm -hmm. So he, he used last year and he's using the first few months of this year to get his assistants like comfortable with the design process, comfortable with the flow, Mm -hmm. comfortable with the whole workflow. So that once his extra space is ready, then we're back to an hour and 40 minute crowns, Mm -hmm. right? Or hour and a half crowns where his time is only an hour for the whole thing Mm -hmm. from prep to seat. He's got 40 minutes to an hour in, but if they don't have that plan in mind to be able to add space, they really have to prepare themselves for, you know, the restriction on chair time in the beginning just to get comfortable with the technology. That's yeah. what I've seen. 
Well, and that's why sometimes you see you walk into an office and you see a Sarek sitting over in the corner and it's paperweight because it is taking more time. And there has to be patience to get through that point. Right. And it's totally doable. It's just at what point do you onboard it and what are you willing to invest in your downtime to get the whole workflow mastered and delegate as much as you can to your assistants? But to John's point, a lot of, for whatever reason, when it comes to the clinical component, a lot, at least a lot of the dentists that I work with, they want to understand how it works. And they want to get it perfect before they delegate it out. Yep. Instead of saying, you know what? I don't have to understand it perfectly. I have to understand it just enough. I have to understand the outcome and let my assistants figure out right. the design. As long as they know my rules for what I want the end to look like, mm-hmm. I'm going to let my assistants figure that out. And I'm going to give them guidance and direction but I'm going to let them own that piece. And I still have some doctors who just will not. And, and I'm talking guys who have had Sarek for three to five years, and they're still unwilling to give up the design mm-hmm. because they have this limiting belief that an assistant can't do it as well as they can, or what they do is special, which I'm not saying it's not, but again, when you're you're running a business, you have to look at it from all of these varying angles, right? To see what is in the best interest of the whole. Yeah. Sure. I can't imagine how difficult it is for them to delegate stuff like that. Because oh, yeah. I struggle delegating like, take this email and turn it into a form. <laughs> and I'm <laughs> and I'm really bad about stepping on Brittany's toes like that. Um that document that I sent out that had the uh, icebreakers on it. Yeah. Right? Like I took, you saw the email that Kim sent out that was asking for everybody's input. I forwarded it to Brittany. I said, Hey, can you take all these ideas and put them into a document? And she asked some questions and asked me, and I answered the questions. We were doing this last night, sitting in the living room and she created it and sent it to me. And I looked at it. I'm like, that is not what I envisioned. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I went to the document and I've, you know, my, seeing my personality like i had to like make it a certain font and then i had to have it a certain format and this had to be bold and this had to be like an outline format so then i redid it and i put the logo on it and i redid it and sent it out and i just know when she sees that she's gonna be pissed <laughs> <laughs> i'm the same way though i i think it, when i delegate something to somebody i i have a certain way in my head how i want mm-hmm. it and it oh, doesn't so ever turn out that way but yeah. see, here's the thing. Now, as coaches, we have the tools. So you go to the correction format and you say, okay. <laughs> oh, no, I did not do my part at all. <laughs> right, right. Right. Yeah, yeah. And that's how we, we didn't up. explain like, it we, the right way. Yeah. Yes. Right. Yeah. Right. We don't give them enough direction. We don't give right. them enough detail. We don't let them know what our evidence procedure is for a good job. We right. don't give them a picture of what the end needs to look like. And so we get back something that doesn't meet our expectations yeah. and it is not their fault. Yeah. Right. Like, said, Marilyn always. Failure, and then we're disappointed when they fail. <laughs> right. Well, Marilyn, Marilyn will always come to me and she's so apologetic. I, did, I mean, I love her. She's so apologetic and she'll come to me and be like, Reagan, I didn't know when I did this, but then this happened. And, and I, and I'm like, it is not your fault. I own that. That's mm-hmm. not you. That's me. I own it. Right. So we're going to do it again and make sure this, 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 this is in place. And this is what the end result needs to look like. But when you have S's and C's on your team, they always like bless their hearts. And I feel bad because I'm like a full on freaking DI. And so I'm like, end result, this is... <laughs> <laughs> but um, they'll, they'll always come back to me and, and be very apologetic. And then I have to recognize that was, that was my, that was, I dropped the ball, yeah. right? That wasn't you. I dropped the ball and I own it. So now this is what we need to do to fix it. Yeah. Right. It's interesting. I always know when, I always know when she's like working at night or on the weekends, cause I, I'll still check my email on my phone. But like on the weekends, I don't necessarily reply, right? 
And I always know when she's like working on the weekends, because I'll have like 15 emails from QuickBooks <laughs> with codes wanting access to QuickBooks. <laughs> and then finally she'll call me and she'll be like, and she'll like, she'll leave me a message. And then by the time I call her back, I've done got like 12 new codes. So the one that she called me about that one doesn't work anymore. Right. <laughs> I wish you could have been on the call we had when um, when Marilyn kept getting locked out of online banking. And of mm. course, it's my email and my cell phone number. So they kept sending me the code and I was in a consult or something. And so <laughs> I kept getting these text messages about you need to reset your internet password, right? You, you're fraud or whatever. And so I reset it. And then she tried to log in and it didn't work. And then I had to reset it again. And then she tried to log in and it didn't work. And then I changed, <laughs> I changed the login password to a word she would never forget. <laughs> and it was, it was very obscene and colorful. <laughs> but I thought she will never forget this password. <laughs> Hey, what a uh, couple of questions. What percentages are you seeing uh, for specialists? Like not, not a 1099 coming in with your own assistant, but like just in, let's say in a perio practice, what percentage are you seeing for like perio associates or oral surgery associates? I haven't seen a perio. So I've seen an oral surgery associate, but he came in with his own assistant, mm -hmm. his own materials, his own supplies. And he made 50% mm -hmm. of his production. Sounds about right. Okay. I've had... Um, collectible production, right? Collectible production. Okay. Right. Um, Pedo Associates are going to make, you know, 38 to 42 mm -hmm. from what I've seen. Um, Endo Associates are going to make at least 50, 40 mm -hmm. to 50. I mean, somewhere, somewhere in that neighborhood. Yeah, I'm well, looking... I take that back on endo. Um, on endo, it could be 38 to 43, but that's with like a um uh what do you call it? A graduated skill increase. So like if you hit this level of production, you right, own right, right. percentage kind of thing. Yeah, I can't find any like general rules of thumb. I've been looking everywhere for them. I couldn't find anything in dental economics. It's like they're not nailed down anywhere. I'm like, I'm trying to. I'm trying to find out what's the what's like the standard so I can create a document that's got that on there. And I haven't been able to find it anywhere. Well, you know that a a general dentist as an associate is going to make, you know, 28 to 32, mm -hmm. right? They're going to make somewhere in that window. A specialist is always going to command more because they can charge more. They right. can bill more. And insurance companies are going to pay more. So that's where you enter into that 38 to 43 range. Um, and the oral surgeon that we had come in, the only reason he made 50% was because he brought his own supplies. He brought his own assistant, his own nurse. And so he was assuming all of those costs. Actually, I think we paid him 55. Yeah, actually. probably 55 sounds more accurate. I, I kind of approach it from the other, from the, from the expense side. So in a GP practice, you're looking at a target profit margin of 40%. Yeah. Owner doctor needs to make 10% on what the associate does. So the associate's going to make 30% and the owner doctor's going to make 10. Yeah. Follow what I'm saying? Yep. So in a specialty practice, profitability is higher, right? So in an oral surgery practice, you're putting 60% on the bottom line. So your associate's going to make probably closer to 50, but there's not a, there's not like a, I haven't seen that like outlined anywhere. It's more speculative than anything. It's very subjective. And I won't well, say I will, I will say this though. Um, one of my clients, and they're in Charlotte, they're multi-doctor, but they only run two doctor, two doctors a day. Mm -hmm. So the doctors have four chairs, hygiene has four chairs, they have eight ops. They run at 50% overhead. 30% of that is for their team. Mm -hmm. So we, and, and they decided that I did not recommend that. That's what they felt good about, but they pay their team 30% of, you know, revenues, but they, so, which basically means they operate with like a 20% overhead oh. and their insurance, their insurance heavy, which I find interesting. Mm -hmm. Like they're one of the few offices I've ever worked with 
that we're able to drive that level of profitability to the bottom line and have that high of a staff compensation model where their overhead costs are fit, not fixed, but they're they're set within that 20% range. Yeah. Interesting. How many, how many hygienists do you have on percentages? I don't think any. Not even partial percentage? No. <clears throat> Excuse me. Bless you. Not outside of bonus. I don't have any that are, that are never, complicated on percentage. I've never been, a, I'm not a big fan of 100% commission. Um, I think that I've just seen that some people flourish under that. Other people don't. In my experience, the the motive, almost every time I've seen that, the motive, the doctor's motive to to u- utilize that compensation structure for hygienists is because they don't want to hold them accountable. It's kind of like, well, if I put them on a percentage and they, they're not productive and they don't keep their schedule full and they don't pre-appoint, they don't you know, enroll fluoride or whatever, they don't do the things I want them to do, I don't have to pay them. And I'm like, that's really a bass backwards approach to leadership. But to each his own. So I've never been a big fan of it for that reason. But I do like the idea of a base and a percentage, you know, because you want you want a couple of things here. So you want the hygienist to be in an environment where she can make up to one third of collectible production, right, of her collectible production. And so <clears throat> having her at a competitive hourly rate, we're talking gross compensation. So if she's got benefits, that's included, right? Um, but having it to where, let's say that she's, her net production is $160 an hour and she's currently making 40. So that has her at 25%, right? And if we want her to get up to 30 or 33, then at $120, she's at a third. So pay, keep her at the $40 an hour, but then give her 30 or 33% of anything over 120 rather than giving her like a, an hourly raise, like a, a dollar more per hour, $2 more per hour. You follow what I'm saying? So it, I it, do. I do. And, and, and I think it's a bigger conversation. So the hygienists typically do not have governance over what insurance plans the doctors go and network with. Mm-hmm. Many are not comfortable having those conversations with the front desk about how to engineer their schedule where you balance certain plans with other plans, right? Um, So because they don't have governance or say so over what plans the, the owner goes into network with, that drastically impacts their collectible production. For sure. Yeah, but so, how- how do you take two two practices across the street from one another? One of them's heavily insurance driven and one of them's fee for service. One of them's making $360 on a new patient appointment. One of them's making 150. Yeah. You know what I mean? And you've got hygienist A making $38 an hour and hygienist B making 55 an hour and they're across the street from one another. Yeah. You see what I'm saying? I do. I totally get it. Now, if I'm that if I'm that fee for service doctor and I realize you know, where my compensation falls along the spectrum, right, of hygienists in that zip code, I'm going to be a little bit more picky about the hygienists that I hire. Yeah. You know, as you should be. Yeah. And I think because if you they have to be able, they have to be able to overcome insurance objections mm-hmm. to getting fluoride, to getting x rays, to getting the cleaning. They have to be able to overcome insurance objections when it comes to moving forward with treatment. So the skill set, Mm -hmm. has to be different. Yeah. Right. But in that same vein of thought, it's also as, as the hygienist being compensated hourly for doing hygiene work, when someone really buys into the heart of an organization, they'll make sure their schedule's filled, even though most will depend on the front desk to make sure that that happens. There are some, if they're really bought in, to the heart of the organization, they'll do their part Mm -hmm. to make sure that they have someone to serve, right? To make sure that they're looking at all of the ancillary services and products that this patient could benefit from because it's part of that whole, it's just part of the organizational DNA, Mm -hmm. right? So, and not every practice is going to feel comfortable 
which I challenge a lot of my clients on this, but not every practice is going to feel comfortable going completely fee for service until there is so much demand on their schedule or on their hygienist schedule that they see no choice. Yeah. But to go that route. Right? That's, a, well, that's a great point too, because I see a lot of people wait way too long, man. Yeah. It's like the that that office that I mentioned earlier that's doing like 560, right? I was in his schedule and I kept clicking. I was counting, looking for openings and hygiene. When can I get a new patient? When can we put SRP? When can we put a recare patient in there? I kept clicking. Click, 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 click. And I'm like, okay, surely it's going to open up here. We're at like 10 weeks out. Okay, any moment now, 12 weeks out, any moment now, 15 weeks out, any moment now, six months, six consecutive months, you can't get a recare patient in his hygiene schedule. Yeah. I was like, insane, man. Insane. Yeah, money on the table. Yes. Yeah. And, I'm and then you run into this. So, so because I work in North Carolina, I know this in Tennessee and Alabama and some of the states that you guys work in, we don't run into this, but in North Carolina, a doctor cannot check more than two hygienists. Right. So he can check three hygiene rooms or she can check three hygiene rooms, but in order to enable that, they have to do assisted hygiene. Mm-hmm. Right. They can't see three hygienists unless right. they bring on another provider. Yeah. It's just one of their regulatory rules. In Tennessee, we don't necessarily run into that. Mm-hmm. In Alabama, we don't really run into that. Right. What about South uh, Carolina. I don't know about South Carolina. South Carolina has that restriction either. Oh. Yeah. Because what they what they've got to do, like there, there are. I was talking to another client. She's trying to figure out if it's the right time to bring in an associate. And I'm like, all right, there there are certain like target metrics that need to be present in order for it to, in order for you to be able to justify an associate. And I'm looking at the numbers and I'm looking at the numbers. I'm like, you're just not there. You know, you've got X, you don't have 2000 active patients, right? You're only running two columns of hygiene. There's just not enough there. And so unless that associate's bringing in procedures that she's not doing, which she's not, right? And I'm like, you know, you're not going to be able to bring her in and it not take money out of your pocket, right? And so I like, I call it priming the pump, right? It's like, you, yes, once you're like six, seven, eight weeks out without any openings in hygiene, that's the appropriate time to, to start adding hygiene. Add a day, add an assisted hygiene. You need to create capacity to get more hygiene patients in there, Okay. However, if your goal is to bring on an associate, right, you, and, and without it impede your productivity, keep in mind the standard of care issue, right? Because same things on the doctor side. If you're pushing, if you're putting crowns out like four months, right, right, that's a big problem. If you're putting, if you can't get SRP in in six weeks, that's a big problem, right? So make sure that you're, you're not, you don't have a standard of care. You're not compromising standard of care, but prime the pump a little bit, right? So let, let hygiene build up a little bit so that when you bring that associate in, you can then consolidate. Now, so now that your associate has a full column of hygiene. Yes. Right. And if the, if the pump is not primed and you've only got X number of patients and there's still quite a bit of capacity on the doctor's schedule and the doctor's taking home X amount and doesn't want to take home less and you're trying to squeeze an associate in there, it's not going to fly. You got to rob from Peter to pay Paul. Yeah, exactly right. You know, so one of one of our clients um, that Sam and I work with, that's one of the things we started doing last June. So she did a, a recent build out, added three operatories. I believe it may have been four, um, added some operatories. We started doing assisted hygiene four days a week. So now instead of two hygiene columns, she's running three. Mm -hmm. And that was in anticipation of when she got into her new facility, she's going to have a column of hygiene to feed an associate, Mm -hmm. which also means because her schedule gets inundated with fillings. So she can start allowing the associate to check that third room of hygiene. They can start taking over her fillings and the emergencies, let her focus on crown bridge and implants Mm -hmm. right until so and we're backlog on new patients so we also once the associate gets in we free up a room bring in another hygienist or another hygiene assistant 
another hygiene assistant and dedicate a room to new patient visits. Yeah. Help the the associate build their active patient base. But she has 3,700 active patients. Active Active, patients? Active. In the last 18 months. This is one doctor? One doctor. And I bet her, I bet her recare effectiveness is really low, isn't it? It is, but yes. it's only because now that we've branched into the new building, her recare effectiveness is getting better because yeah. now we're running assisted hygiene for now she, now she can get them in. Right. Now she can get them in and we're reserving blocks for the new patients. And she keeps asking me, she's like, Are you sure I can get an associate? And I'm like, honey, you're way past two for an associate. <laughs> You know, like you don't have to worry about feeding the associate. The the patients are there. Yeah. That's a non load. Yeah. Then the associate gets in. Right. You know, I get a little concerned with some of the the comments and things that I I see floating around out there. Like, there's a statistic. I won't I won't name the company that <clears throat> promotes this, but there's a couple of statistics out there. They say that you know. When you add an associate, you add 33% on average, statistically. When you add an associate, you add 33% to production. Or some, Yeah, that's what, that's what it is. When you do a rehab or a build-out, you automatically add 30 to 33%. I think it's 30 or 33% to production. And although certainly possible, sure, Um if your practice is in a position to need to do those two things, right? Like if you don't need to add an associate and you throw an associate in there, that associate's not magically going to create 30% increase in revenue. Right. right? Just because you added six operators doesn't mean that they're going to be full on Monday. <laughs> right? Wow. right. So there are practices out there that do it at the right time. So I, what I told the d- doctor, I was talking to a doctor and he got this feedback from somebody and he mentioned it to me and I'm like, forget everything you just heard from that person because and I, I take that back not, not to be disrespectful at all um because I, I i don't understand the context in which the conversation was had okay so give them the benefit of doubt but for every one person that adds an associate and production shoots up 30 40 percent or builds out an additional six operatories and the practice jumps up 30 40 percent production for every one of those, you've got 10 people who did those two things way too early. Right. And and struggled to make their mortgage payment for the next two years. Yeah. And keep that associate fed. Right. And so, when you say mortgage payment, he's not just talking about the mortgage payment on the building. He's talking right. about your actual home yeah. mortgage payment. Because you've got to feed that associate to keep them there. Too early. Right. Yeah. yeah. And so there are people that that have a plan going into it that know, okay, this is the right time. This is the right, this is the appropriate time I'm, I've got. I can't get recare in. I can't add an operatory because I'm in a lease space, right? And I've only got four operatories and I'm I'm backed up on the doctor's schedule. I can't get fillings on my schedule for eight, nine, 10 weeks. I can't get crown and bridge on my schedule for three or four weeks. I need three columns of hygiene. I've only got two, right? Don't and and let's say I'm fee for service. So I can't drop insurance plans to control demand. So the only option you've got is to build a new building right? Or relocate into a space that's got more operatories. You follow what I'm saying? So if you're in that position and you do that, yeah, you're going to see a huge jump like in production. If if restorative schedules backed up and the associate that you're bringing in is, let's say a GPR, right? He's going to be doing sinus lifts and anterior implants and bone grafting and, and and third molar extractions. He's adding all these procedures plus hygiene's backed up and you plug that associate in. Yeah. You're going to skyrocket. Right. But you know, if you've got 1100 patients and you're struggling to keep your schedule full with restorative <laughs> and you're checking one and a half columns of hygiene with, you know, it's just, and you throw an associate in there, you're both going to starve to death. Yeah. And I'd also say this, if, <laughs> they run into the scenario where they don't have the foundational systems in place to keep their hygiene. Cause, cause I know all of you have run into this where the front office team isn't very proactive with reactivation because they get so many phone calls, mm-hmm. right. For new patients, so many phone calls for patients wanting to schedule hygiene. They don't focus on the 700, 800, 1200, 1500 patients that haven't been in in a while. Right. 
So because they're focused on the urgent, they're focused on getting in those who are demanding to get in. And so the other thing that those practices that onboard an associate to quickly, the other thing they run into is, let's say they open up a couple of columns, one for the doctor and one for hygiene, and that column starts to meet the demand. But then they have all of these other patients that they're not they're not keeping active, then eventually the well runs dry. Mm -hmm. That's one of the things that concerns me about um, giving the hygienist a percentage is if the rest of the staff knows that that the hygienist is getting a percentage of what they do, how how vested are they going to be in doing recare calls for the hygienist? Well, the right hygienist will see a lot of value in that. Mm -hmm. the hygienist who just wants to pay her bills may or may not be as proactive with that. Um, But I also, if a hygienist is making a percentage on what she produces, there's, I have this interior battle of, well, then are they still eligible for the team bonus? Since technically they're already bonusing. See, right. I, oh, that's such a great question because I'm 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 sh- I'm dealing with this same issue, this exact same issue in two different practices. In one practice, they're included in the bonus, and the other practice are not. And me personally, me personally, I think they should be included in the bonus program because the percentage attached to their hourly that's part of their like standard compensation package. Bonus is a, a separate from that. You see what I'm saying? Gotcha. Mm-hmm. So there's there's an allocation. There's a there's a ratio for. I can tell you disagree with me, so I want your feedback. No, uh, it, it depends on what percentage they're making on their production. Mm-hmm. Because if they're making, let's say, thirty to thirty five percent on their production, there is no profit. There might be five percent profit that drops to the bottom line off of what they produce, mm-hmm. but it's going to be minimal, mm-hmm. negligible. Right. So then that means that what the rest of the team is really bonusing off of is going to be the restorative work because there's no profit left Mm -hmm. on the hygiene side. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. And so, you know, there might be an adjusted bonus, but, you know, I think it depends on the team. Yeah. They're more, they're more profitable on new patient SRP, perio ancillaries, adjunctives, they're more profitable in that stuff. So that's where hygiene, the hygiene department, for the most part, your typical hygiene department is break even. It's a necessary cost, right? It makes $400,000 a year. It costs you $400,000 a year, but you can't not have it because that's where two thirds of your restorative dentistry comes from. Right. Right. So, but if you've got a more comprehensive hygiene department, that's got a 35 percent perio percentage and 85 percent fluoride you follow what i'm saying and and one out of every two patients that comes through hygiene gets oral id right so when you've got those kinds of things built in there there's additional profitability now you made a hundred thousand another hundred thousand dollars in revenue on top of the four hundred thousand that it cost you unless but here's the thing unless the hygienist is making her same percentage on all of those ancillary services Mm -hmm profitability doesn't change. The production goes up, right? The production and the revenues go up, but if she's still making that same percentage, the profitability doesn't really change. It so let's say, in a practice, let, let's say, Jocelyn, I saw your text message. I've got to run, you guys. I'm sorry. Right, see you run. Later. No, that's okay. Thank Bye. you. Bye. So if you've got a hygienist that, that, generates $150 and she makes 50. She makes a third, right? And then seven or the other 100 is the rest of the overhead in the practice. Okay. So she's break even. If she sells a fluoride for 40 bucks or call, let's call it 60 bucks, to make the math, make the math simple. She sells a fluoride for 60. She gets 20. That's a third. There's 40 left over. There's no additional over. Well, the exception of the supply cost. So let's say that that's 10, right? So there's 30 that came out plus the 10, there's 40. There's just 60% left over. 
Well, that's 60 for that other 60% is all profit. Okay. I guess I'm thinking in terms of if she, if she, if her collections for an hour is 200 and she's making 30% on that 200, mm-hmm. right? So that means she's making what? $60 on that 200. The fixed overhead for the practice, the, the, the minimal profit margin, or I guess the maximum is going to be that 22% sliver, mm-hmm. right? Where fixed costs have been met, but your direct costs are still going to be there. Yeah. So the oh, more yeah. we yeah. see, the more front desk we're going to need. Mm-hmm. Right. The more restorative we enroll, the more doctors, the more assistance we're going to need. So there's this constant <clears throat> kind of balancing act. You know what I mean? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So, and then it's and then if if we are running a healthy overhead at, say, 60 percent in that range, if we are running a healthy overhead, but the hygienist is already making 30 percent off of what she collects. Mm-hmm. then how do we, how is that extra quote unquote bonus justified when she's basically bonus? So, so we're talking about the difference between a hygienist who is a great enroller who, you know, instead of making $45 an hour, she averages 60 mm-hmm. because she enrolls so many services and products. So she averages 60 Versus another one on a flat rate <clears throat> that's being paid 43. Well, over the course of a month, then her bonus, the one making 43, the bonus that she makes covers the gap between 43 and 60. Yeah. But if you're if you're already at the the top of your compensation model then the only place their bonus can come from would really be what is collected and enrolled on the restorative side, right? Yeah. Well, let me, let me do this. So the profit margin and the, and you're almost out of time, the profit margin in the practice is let's say that we want it to be 40%, right? Well, that 40% is an average, right? Because you've got, you know, let's say 10%, profit on hygiene and you've got whatever the other side of it is 65% profit on restorative. And when you average those two out, you get 40. So the profit margin that you see on your P and L is an average across all of your services, right? You got implants, which are more profitable than crowns. Crowns are more profitable than SRP. SRP more profitable than, than, than recare. Oh, right? Yeah. But the number of procedures that you do, the fee attached to it, the overhead attached to it, you have an average and that average is 40%. Okay. Right. So if the hygienist is making $40 an hour, she's producing 160, she's currently at 25, but I want her to be able to make up to 33. So effectively, I, I want I want to give her a raise. Okay. And so I'm paying her, let's say I'm, I'm giving her the opportunity. I've got it controlled, so it can't go above 33, but it can be below. So I've got it locked in, controlled, tapped out at 33. So I'm paying her at 33. Okay. $33, and, 33%. 33%. Of anything over her baseline. So if she's making $40 an hour, that's a third of 120. Okay. Gotcha. Right? So I'm going to keep her at $40 an hour and I'm going to give her 30, 33% of anything that she produces over 120. Right. So that now has her controlled at, at a third. Okay. Right. And let's say the payroll on the rest of the staff take the hygienist out of the equation, the payroll on the rest of the team is 25%. Okay. And then I look at, at the end of the year, I pull my P&L, what were my total staff costs divided by total revenue? What's that percentage? Okay. And if I take the average of those two, let's say it's about 28, 28% total. Okay. So if I just pay my non-hygiene staff if I just let them bonus at 20%, okay, then the amount of money that I pay out at 20% will be less than the amount of money that I pay out at 20% if I included hygiene in the equation. Oh, sure. Yeah. The amount of money that I pay out at, the more money I pay out at 20%, the lower my total staff percentage because it was paid out at 20. My current staff percentage is 28. <laughs> so the more money I pay out at 20, 
the faster I drive that 28% down to 20. See what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So the so actually having them participate in bonus. Now I do <laughs> I do think having them on that 33%, that does impede the team's ability to bonus a little bit, right? Because they're able to make more. So I do get that side of it. But if if I the paying them a bonus at 20% almost offsets the fact that I'm paying them 33% of anything over that baseline because their baseline's at 25%. Well, but here's here's the other thing, and I am gonna have to jump because I've got to get ready for this call. So at 33%, that means that the stagnant BAM is out the window because we never know what their 33% is gonna be. Mm-hmm. Right. So <coughs> If let's say we want to pay our hygienist 33% of what they collect, but we want to control staff salaries mm-hmm. at that 25% mark, right? Mm-hmm. And that's always going to be a moving target. It would be hard to do yeah. like a stagnant BAM because it'd always be moving because of cancellations, no shows, what they're able to feel, what they're not. I yeah. think this is a great conversation. I want to continue this. I think because- I think it can be done either way. I don't think there's a right way or a wrong way. You know what I mean? Because if you if you just if you have if you say okay, the 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 hygienist bonus is the 33% over 120. That's their bonus. Right. The rest of the team has this separate bonus. Okay. I do see I'm a little challenged because there's a little dissension there. We got two different programs. You got yeah, the hygiene team and then you got the rest of the team. So I kind of, you know, that I, I tr- I'm troubled with that a little bit. I do see how the hygienist percentage does impede the rest of the team's ability to bonus. Um, I do see how the more people we pay bonus at 20%, the less our total, total, staff's percentages and then again if you just if you just paid the rest of the team at the rest of the team at 20 and then you took the average of that with hygiene i don't know how much i'd have to actually do the math to see how much the difference would be but again i don't don't think there's a right or a wrong either way i think make your people happy exactly (laughs) boils down to yeah Focus yeah. on retention. Make your people happy. <laughs> Keep them as long as you can. Oh, that was a great. That was a great thing I, I came across the other day. I was reading a white paper, and uh, four. What was it? Uh, I think it was four to six percent of a practice's payroll percentage. Um, if that practice experiences turnover, and your average practice experiences turnover, a good turnover ratio is about ten percent. They say that's a pretty good place to be, right? So if you're 10% or higher, when you do the math on what the estimated cost of replacing a person is, and that's estimated to be one third of that person's annual salary. So if you've got a hygienist making, you know, $60,000 a year and you lose that hygienist, it's going to cost you $20,000 to replace that person. Oh, so I've heard, I've heard it's at one and a half times one, their uh, annual salary. Yeah, I saw and that. that's too. because... And I think that's more accurate because you have to assimilate them into your culture. You have the training aspect, maybe not always for a hygienist, but definitely for a front desk and an assistant. Yeah. The cost to train them and onboard them and get them assimilated yeah. is much greater from a, a stress, maybe not from a monetary, can we monetize this? But from a stress, frustration, overwhelm, burnout standpoint, Okay. I've I, seen it across yeah. all of my teams. Yeah, I'll give that to you. I can't I, I have a hard time justifying that that number. I saw that one too. And I was like, man, that just seems way high. Cause I, I did a couple of examples on paper and I was like, million dollar practice, three hundred thousand dollars on payroll, hygienists are making this. It's not gonna cost me one hundred and fifty thousand dollars to replace that hygienist. No, right. but that one hundred and fifty thousand you have to think is loss in production because the new person okay. isn't yeah, yeah, yeah. And isn't as focused. You're also going to think about the people hired to train them because they're taking on that burden and sure. then they have their own emotional anatomy, right? So they get frustrated, burned out, overwhelmed, which means they lose sight on what their key focus should be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So it's it's the, the cumulative impact yeah. on what it takes to turn. Now, I've also seen the opposite. 
So I've had teams get really like um, uncomfortable when they lose like a key team member Mm -hmm. because they've been with them for 20 years or for 15 years or whatever. But after that first year, when you bring in someone who doesn't share the old limiting beliefs of the other team members or someone who doesn't know that these goals can't be met, I've also seen the opposite happen. Yeah. Where the practice immediately jumps because Mm -hmm. they're not stagnated by the old. Yeah. I've seen that. I've seen that too. And I guess the question then to ask is if, if, if is, is having this, and I'm, I'm using a third, right? Cause I can, like, I've done the, I've actually physically done the math and like said, okay, yeah, that, that makes sense. So if is having like, when you're debating on whether I should replace this person or not, Right now, obviously, there's a due diligence period. Never just going to fire anybody. There's a communication process that needs to be, take place. They deserve the 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 respect and the opportunity to improve. All that stuff. Okay, all that's done, and you're like at the end of your correction format, and the answer to number six is is yes or no, right? Right. Uh, if but they're great clinically. Let's say is having this person in your practice costing you. Is 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 having this person in your practice costing you a third or a half or whatever number you want to use growth by having them there? You see what I'm saying? Yep. I like in other words, in other words, if you replaced them with somebody and it cost you a third of their annual salary to replace them, would you make that up and then some? If so, then financially it's a justified decision too. So not only emotionally. And logically, and from a leadership perspective, you've checked all the boxes, right? From a financial standpoint, it makes sense to pull the trigger too. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, I did. Oh, I know you got to go. Yeah. I got to go too. So, yeah. Sorry. Good talk, though. So, we yeah, I enjoyed need it. to circle back around to this talk when we're in Miami next week. Yeah, I've got a, I've got a bunch of these credits I need to burn up because I got, uh, I was stagnant for a few weeks, so I didn't record anything, and so now I need to use these things up before they take them away from me. <laughs> so. Okay. Well, maybe we can, maybe we can eat up a few next week since we'll all be together. Oh, we will. Yeah. I might need to buy a little microphone to carry down with me so we can do some live ones or something, but I'll figure it out. Yeah. But anyway, enjoy your call and right. uh, talk to you soon. All right. See you soon.